السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته الحمد لله الحمد لله العظيم الخبير المتعالي الحمد لله الذي لا تحجبه ظلمات الليالي الحمد لله الذي أرسل جبال العوالي سبحانه من إله عظيم يغفر الذنوب ولا يبالي لا إله إلا الله بها نحيا وبها نموت وبها نلقى الله وبها نوالي وأشهد أن عظيمنا وقدوتنا ومولانا قرة عيني محمد ابن عبد الله عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وخليله أرسله كافة للناس بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا فبلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة فكشف الله به الغمة وجاهد في الله حق جهاده حتى أتاه اليقين اللهم فجزه عنا خير ما جزيت نبيا عن أمته ورسولا عن دعوته ورسالته وبعد <coughs> My beloved brethren, most respected elders, mothers and sisters um, First of all it is a pleasure to be amidst you and alhamdulillah thumma alhamdulillah for the ni'ma and blessing of Islam that I come from a country far from you and um, we share little uh, background in common but as soon as I see you and wallahu shahidun ala ma fi qalbi there is nothing but love and admiration and respect and awe of you in my heart and I know the same is true in reverse so alhamdulillah for this deen and alhamdulillah um, for Islam and alhamdulillah for guidance and this is what we rejoice in قُلْ بِفَضْلِ اللَّهِ أَيْ بِالْقُرْآنِ وَبِرَحْمَتِهِ أَيْ بِسُنَّةِ فَبِذَلِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُ In this we rejoice. And my Allah Rabbul Izzah, the one who gathered us here on his obedience in one the house, in one of his houses, may he Azza wa Jal join us together in Jannatul Firdaus. And as it is easy for him to join us here, it is easy for him to join us there. Not that we are worthy of it, but because his mercy supersedes all. In my study of history, <coughs> um, the topic given to me today is the beginning of the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Um, and in my reading of the history, there are certain things I have noted. Any time a great personality is coming, Allah Rabbul Izzah in his infinite wisdom chooses to highlight that personality with certain aspects so that his birth will be highlighted, you will not miss it. His lineage will be highlighted, you won't miss it. So if you look at our Prophet alayhi afdala salatu wa atammu taslim, his father is Abdullah and it could have been, uh, you know, he, he could have been unnoticed in history, but Allah Rabbul Izzah chose to sacrifice a hundred camels so that his name is highlighted so you don't get it wrong, which Abdullah is this and which Abdullah is this. Allah Rabbul Izzah chose to highlight. <coughs> and in Arab history, it was a big thing, you know, this is Abdullah, the one a hundred camels have been sacrificed. And can you imagine, in a time where there's no refrigeration, when a hundred camels are killed, you have to distribute the meat. So there's barbecues across Mecca. Everyone remembers this is the feast of Abdullah. So Allah Rabbul Izzah chose to highlight the lineage of the Rasul. And then the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It could have been another year. But Allah Rabbul Izzah in His infinite wisdom chose to highlight it. You know how? I will tell you how, inshaAllah ta'ala. Uh, <clears throat> There's a surah in the Quran called Surah Al-Buruj. Wa al-Buruj. 
واليوم الموعود وشاهد ومجهود قتل أصحاب الأخدود النار ذات الوقود إذ هم عليها قعود وهم على ما يفعلون بالمؤمنين شهود The scholars of tafsir and the hadith is in the sunan of Imam Ahmad narrate this narration <coughs> that in the past غالباً in Yemen there was a king and the king was on a faith he had his particular belief. And the king, in the olden days, you will find this in the time of Fir'aun as well, to establish themselves, they used to have sahirs, you know, magicians. Uh, these days they have the intelligence, you know, who knows stuff, he hears stuff, he gives you little, little just to show you that he, the king is under control. So the king had a sahir, a magician. You know, and the magician has his jinns, and the jinns will go report stuff and do little things. And the, you do understand me, he will establish the awe of the king over the khalq. So the magician was growing old, and doesn't matter what you are, Subhan al Khaliq, Allah is the king of kings. So when, when the king decides your life, you know, as in Allah Rabbul Azza decides your ajal has come, no amount of magic and medicine and food and security guards and pomp and ceremony will save you from Allah Rabbul Azza. So the magician realized that the ajal is coming, death is coming. So he sent to his master, to the king, says, listen, my time is near. Give me an intelligent young man so that I can train, so that, you know, the awe of your realm could remain. <clears throat> so the king found this intelligent young lad and sent him as the disciple to this magician. And the young lad was on his way to the magician. On his way, he saw a rahib, a monk. And Ghaliban, this is the Christian monk. So, um, because that was the faith before Islam. So, the, Christ, the young lad is fascinated by, you know in Subhan al-Khaliq, taqwa in ilm, in hilm is self-evident. You, you, you know, the darkness of magic, the shaitan of magic against the angel and the ruhaniyat and the spirituality and the taqwa of, of tawheed. You know, hal yastawiyani mathala. There's no comp. You see a sinner, you see it on his face. So, he's attracted to the rahib, to the piety. You know, because the fitra is attracted to tawheed. So, he... He spent time with him, and when he realized it's late, he goes, it's late. He ran to the, to the magician. The magician scolded him, and, you know, the teachers of the olden days used to beat you, so he beat him. And uh, he came back to the rahib, he said, oh, and when he went home at night, his parents beat him too. Ya al musiba You know, he goes, why, he, the magician, why are you late? The family, why are you late? So, so he came back to the rahib, to the monk, and complained, you know, I've, I've had a double bashing last night, so what should I do? He said, listen, tell you, the magician that my parents delayed me, tell your parents the magician delayed me, the time that you buy in between, come and spend with me and learn, learn the deen. So he stood in this, you know, learning the magic, subhanallah, and learning, learning the deen. It's two very extremes, yeah, shaitan and, and uh, subhan al-khaliq, like misguidance and guidance together. And then, a day came and there's a beast that came into the village, into the city. And people are running. I don't know if you've ever seen footage of an animal going on rampage. Um, I saw one, um, an elephant went crazy. I was watching a YouTube clip of it in, in India. And Subhan al Khaliq, you know. Uh, and, and it just used to grab a human and do like that, you know, like it's nothing. So a beast came and the beast is um, angry. We don't know what the Quran says, Dab. I mean, the hadith is Dab, a uh, beast. So this young lad took a rock and he said, Ya Rab, whichever rock, if, if the Rahib is more beloved to you than the magician, kill this beast with this rock. Because the beast is not going to die with a rock. You know, but this is to show me that. So he chucked it and the beast died. So he goes, the, the Rahib is right. 
So he came to the Rahib and he said, uh, you know, I, I killed the beast last night and I did it like this. So the Rahib realized that, that uh, you know, this kid has reached a level probably above me, you know, in his Iman Billah. So he said, and Subhan, remember this, the most trialed and tribulated people, as in the most tested people are the Anbiya. You'll read, the, if I had time, if Allah Rabbul Izzah had given respite, that I would go through the seerah with you, you would see what your Rasul went through. Don't think religion came to you by coincidence. The, the Rasul, alayhi afdalu salatu wa tammu taslim, they say we saw him. Salawatu Rabbi wa salamuhu alayhi. Walking in the days of Hajj from tent to tent. And there was a person walking behind him, following him, and chucking stones at him. And he used to, used to hit his blessed face, so his mouth was bleeding, so he used to wash his mouth and continue. Saying, Qulu la ilaha illallah tuflihu. Do you know who the man was pelting him? His own uncle Abu Lahab. So don't think religion came accidentally. This came by the blood, sweat, and tears of the, of the first generation. So, <clears throat> as Iman grows, tests will come. Because Allah says so. مَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيَذَرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ عَلَى مَا أَنْتُمْ عَلَيْهِ حَتَّى يَمِيزَ اللَّهُ الْخَبِيثَ مِنَ الطَّيِّبِ don't think that you will proclaim Iman and Allah will let you be. He will differentiate between the khabith and the good, the filthy and the good. Otherwise, everyone, khalas, I am Muslim, what's the proof of your Iman? You know, I am a heart surgeon, beautiful, come and operate. Otherwise, we're all heart surgeons. So, حَتَّى يَمِيذَ اللَّهُ الْخَبِيثَ مِنَ الطَّيِّبِ This... So now the, the Rahib knows, you see, the, the, the learned know that if Iman grows, tests will come. So he said, my son, you will be tested now. But if you get tested, don't mention my name. So Allah Rabbul Izzah elevated this young lad in rank. And he used to make dua for people. Allah used to cure. He used to recite. The, uh, the blind used to be able to see. The leper used to become better. And, you know, amidst the sick and amidst the, 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 the troubled, his name grew. You know, like you say, this doctor is very good. The, 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 the young kid's name. I don't know what you have here in, in the UK. I have been here too short to know. But you have uh, Raqis, you know, the ones who do Ruqya. So uh, people say, go to this sheikh, do ruqya with, with, with this sheikh. You know? So his name he started to... And the king's wazir lost his eyesight. You know, the king's, king's advisor lost his eyesight. So he, ha he heard, you know, because the, the Mubtali knows, so they, they went and found the young lad, and he came with a lot of gifts, as young lad. Um, all this is yours, please cure my eyes. So he said, I don't cure. Allah cures. I can make dua. So he goes, do whatever you need to do. Just so he goes, you have to recognize that the shifa is from Allah. So, so he made dua, Allah cured his eyes. So he goes, he cured me. He goes, my Rabb, Jalla Jalala. Ash-Shafi huwa Allah, wal-Kafi huwa Allah. The one who cures understand this Muslims. Aqeedah must be very clear. Your raziq is Allah. Your boss doesn't give you rizq. The one that gives you rizq is Allah. You, I know it's difficult, a concept for those who are brought up in, in, in the West to, to acknowledge, you know, but if I don't work, I don't get paid. I'll give you an example that the awam can understand. If you give me a call, you say, listen, Ustaz, uh, I'm stuck here. Can you please send me a thousand pounds? So I go, khalas, akhi, don't worry, I will send the money in your bank account to go get it from so imagine you go to the ATM, you call it ATM? Yes. So you go, you put your card, you put the code in, you take a thousand dollars out and imagine you start kissing the ATM and hugging the ATM, thank you ATM for sending me the money. ATM didn't send you the money, yachi. I sent you the money. By the same way, Allah Rabbul Izzah sends you the money, whether it's from this boss or that boss or this organization, but the Razak is Allah, these are just ATMs you're taking your money out of. 
If you don't use that one, he'll send it out of that one. Don't even think about this. The one who gives rizq is Allah Jalla Subhanahu. Al-Shafi huwa Allah, wal-Kafi huwa Allah, wal-Raziq huwa Allah, Allah Rabbul Izza Jalla Subhanahu. And remember that, that in your language, attribute the goodness back to the one who gave it to you. Because ya al musibah I give you the money and you're thanking the ATM. I come back to the city and there's no thanks, no nothing. I say, ya al ghaba Oh, Rabbi, I sent you the money and you're there thanking the ATM. You know, you go put flowers on it every night for me. <laughs> Wrong. So the young lad used to attribute, you know, the Shafi is Allah, Jalla Subhana. So this touched the heart of the Wazir. So Wazir went back to the king and he sat. And the king goes, Masha, you know, your, your eyes are fixed. How did your eyes come back? He said, this... Um, Allah Rabbul Izza returned my eyesight. My Rabb returned. My... So he said, Me? Because the king, Ana Rabbukum al A'la, you see arrogance, I am your Lord Most High. This is with regards to the Fir'aun, but this one, by Lord Rabb, because in the Arabic language, you know, Rabb means Lord as well. So he used to refer, Rabb, me? He said, No, my Lord and your Lord. So the king's arrogance, you expect to have me, to have a lord over me, and I am the king. So he punished the man until he gave the name of the boy. So he went and got the boy, and punished the boy until he gave the name of the rahib. Then called the rahib and put a saw on his head. You know the saw? And told him to retract faith. Once Iman goes into the heart, how can, how can after seeing purity you go back to, to impurity? Like once you've drank pure water, how can you go back to sewage? It's, once you've seen light, how can, it's very difficult. So he, I, I can't retract. So he cut him open in half like this. But the, but the strength... Do you see? Alhamdulillah, my Allah, Rabbul Izzah, protect me and you from tests. You know, don't ask for tests. But Alhamdulillah, that Allah, Rabbul Izzah, has given you Islam like this, you know. But can you imagine the test? A saw on your head. Leaf, and there's no diplomacy. There's no, uh, you know, uh, gentleness about it. It's very blunt. Leave, why will cut you in two? He goes, do what you need to do. So he cut him in two. Then he went to the wazir, put the sword on his head, leave. He says, I can't. You know, how can I deny my Lord? So he cut him in two. He came to the young lad. And he, you know, because this is the musibah, he is the problem. So he told his men, take him to the mountain. And throw him from the top of the mountain. Because, you know, he wants a dramatic ending so that everyone understands that, you know, the, there was no Lord. So the 20 or something men climb up with him, up the mountain, carrying him. And um, as he goes up, he makes the dua, Ya Rab, deal with them on my behalf as you please. Suffice me the sharr as you please. So Allah Rabbul Izzah shook the mountain. They all fell down from the mountain and the young lad came back to the king. So he goes, what happened? He goes, my Lord killed him. So now the king's angry, sent another group of men, take him to the ocean in a ship, drown him. The young lad went in the ship with them. Ya Rab, suffice me their sharh as you please. Whatever way you want, Ya Rab, deal with them. So Allah shook them, they fell down, all drowned. He came back to the king. What happened? My Lord killed him. So now the king is in, is in problems. How do I kill this, this person? So the young boy, and this is, this is a da'i, um, tells the king, he says, I'll, I'll show you how to kill me. He says, gather the whole people in one valley. And then tie me or crucify me on a, on a wood, on a palm tree, you know, on, on, on a wood. And then take an arrow from the quiver, from my quiver, 
and put it in the, in the bowl and pull it and say that I kill you or I shoot this by in the name of the Rabb of the lad. In the name of the Lord of this young boy, I kill this boy. So he gathered the whole people, pulled the arrow, says, by the Lord of this boy. And can you imagine? Twenty uh, soldiers who have local families have just died. Another 20 has or so has died in the ocean. The news has gone like wildfire across the city. Everyone knows about this. And the, the reputation has gone up. The boy cannot be killed. You know, the king has become ages and uh, the king doesn't. It's, it's, it's. But at the same time, they're waiting to see the finale. What's, what's the outcome? So now the king came by the name of the... So that's a confession that there's a Lord greater than me and only in his name can I kill the boy. So he shot and it hit the, the young lad. He put his hand on it and, and he died. Everyone became Muslims. Or the faith of that time which Ghaliban is Christianity. So the king realized everyone, you know, like it happened in the time of Musa alayhi salam. Amantu bi Rabbi Haruna wa Musa. I believe in the, the, the Sahara said. So they all believed. So what to do? Uh, he ordered his soldiers to dig uh, pits. They dug pits. They put fuel on it. They burnt the fuel. And they would stand these civilian believers on top of the fuel, on top of the pit. And say, retract or we push you in. They used to say, we jump in. So one, two, three. Like this. And the last one or one of them was a, was a lady with a young babe, young child. Um, and she, you know, because for the innocent, the human heart is naturally inclined to protect the young. So uh, she was doubting, you know. So the young child started to speak. And she said, be patient, you're on the truth, so stand firm. Stand. So she jumped. So Allah Rabbul Izzah says, Jalla Subhana Washa Kutila Ashabul Uhdud and Nari Vatil Wakud Idhum Aleha Kurud Wahum Ala Ma Yafaluna Bil Mu'minina Shuhud they saw what they did to the believers. Now the city had become Christian essentially overnight. And this person annihilated the Christian population. <coughs> News of this went to Ethiopia, Abyssinia. They share a little, uh, ne near Yemen over the sea, just a little uh, bit over the sea. The king there is a Najashi. Najashi is a very devout Christian. So the honor burnt in him, like, I am alive. And he goes and kills Christians. Because I will trample on the soils of of his country. So he sent an army with two generals. Abraha and another one whose name I forget. So they crossed and they avenged the death of the Christians and Yemen fell under the kingdom of an Najashi Ethiopian Christians. The problem is when there's two leaders, there's no peace. You know, I am leader, you're leader, I am general, you're general. And there's constant sabotages. You know, he said this, now, nah, don't listen to him, do this. Oh, it wasn't working. So eventually, these two generals decided to have a duel. Duel was the honorable way of sorting out problems in the olden days. You know, come, khalas, one on one, we'll deal with this and, and sort it out. So, and then the dueling system, for those that know, you take your second best with you. So, this, you know, there's another person that comes in case you fall. So, uh, there's two people on each side. So, they went, Najashi and the other general, the other general stronger, you know, more built than this one. So, he struck Abraha. Abraha shielded, but it cut through the shield and scarred his face. And as Abraha fell, uh, his, Abraha's best man jumped and killed the the general, and then they both killed the other one, so Abraha became overall general. 
The problem is they're both generals of Najashi. He's killed the general of, 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 the, of the emperor. So Najashi wrote a letter that I will come and trample over this, you know, with my soldiers and I will teach you a lesson. So Abraha thought what to do. So he said, listen, Ya Najashi, he was a soldier. I am a soldier. He is your servant. I am your servant. Uh, I, I was only a bit more intelligent than him. So I superseded over him. But we are still in obedience for you. And, O oh king, I will build you a cathedral the like of which hasn't been built for any king before you. So I will make a massive church for you. So uh, Najashi became happy with this, and this man set out to build a cathedral, the like of which was not seen at the time. You know, the scholars say the towers were so high that if you looked up, your hat would fall. This is figure of speech, you know. The towers are very high, so you'd fall, your head tilts backwards. Um, and he used gold and silver on the crosses, ivory on the pulpits, and, and ebony, and so on and so forth. And then he said... The Arabs should turn to he instead of the Kaaba. Now, Arabs have a special characteristic, bless them, Ya Rab. Um, uh, they're very sensitive to insults. You know, they, their sense of sensitivity is very sensitive. So when they said this about the Kaaba, the Arabs got offended. And so what they did is one of their men who got more offended than the others and he's an affiliate of the Quraysh, the tribe of the Prophet wasallam, decided he's going to come and uh, defile the, the cathedral. So scholars differ. Some say the young man came and defecated in the corner of the, of the cathedral. Um, others say they started a fire to keep warm and burnt the whole place down and then ran away irrespective when uh, Abraha found out that they have done this so he said I will erase the Kaaba so Abraha collected an army of 70,000 men and at the head of them 13 elephants and the numbers differ some say 11 but 13 elephants and an Najashi sent a special mammoth of a thing, you know, a big monster of an elephant called Mahmud, to be the, the van or the vanguard or the forefront of this army of elephants. So they entered from Yemen into Arabia. And the Arabs know, obviously, when 70,000 army starts walking, you know where they're going. Because news travels, you know, people talk. So the first Arabs decided to stand up and fight. And, you know, you get a, a, a Arab population was not much. You know, they would have little tribes. They were never uh, one big country. So they decided to resist this army of 70,000. He sorted them out very quick and took one of their leaders, Nufail, as prisoner. You will show me the way to the Kaaba. So Nufail became their prisoner, and Nufail is uh, walking with them and the elephants. And on the way, they reached Ta'if. When they reached Ta'if, Ta'if had heard what had happened there. And Ta'if's got a big idol in, in Ta'if. They didn't want Abraha to make a mistake, you know, and come and get this temple instead of that. So they scam out. They listen, O king, this is not the one. Take this man, he will be your guide to the Kaaba. So they volunteered a guide. In Arab history, this is a shameful moment for, for their people. Um, so much so that this man traveled with them and died at some two miles away from, from Mecca. In a place called Maramis. Um, and in that place, they still stone his grave until today. Because he volunteered to guide someone to the destruction of the Kaaba. Ar. So the 70,000, you know, and, and the Arabs are not used to elephants. You know, even when Khalid ibn al-Walid, rahimahullah ta'ala, went to attack the Persians, he had a huge problem with the elephants. They were good with horses, camels. Elephants was a... And may Allah protect the Arab. If an elephant comes face to face with you, I, I actually do this. Like when I, when I research, I go pretty deep into... I, I actually took footages of these elephants. 
you know, in a four-wheel drive, looks very small to, an to a fully grown mammoth um, Ethiopian elephant. So if, you know, if a huge animal comes for war, it's, it's a scary sight. So the Arabs didn't know what to do with, with this situation. And uh, he's coming 70,000 through the, the cities and so on. And until he came two miles out of Mecca and he camped there. Now, when he camped, he, he's a military strategist. You, know, you don't become a general accidentally. He sent his men to go raid the city. So the horsemen came, went through to create fear and remove resistance. So they collected everything that they could, brought it back to Abraha. And in this booty of war was 200 camels of Abdul Muttalib. Who knows who Abdul Muttalib is? Everyone? The grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu So, Abdul Muttalib and the Quraysh had a meeting. What should we do? They said, there's no way you can resist this army. Um, we will evacuate the city. As they're in this discussion, envoy of Abraha came, and they said the king, I mean the general wishes to meet the leader of the of Mecca, of the Quraysh. So people sent Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This little incident will show you certain things, you see. So Abdul Muttalib entered the tent of Abraha. Who is Abdul Muttalib? He is the chief of the tribe that Abraha can destroy like, uh, like, like this. Yeah. But when he entered, they say Abraha stood up for him. Do, uh, there's no, a king that is conquering doesn't stand up for the one he's conquered. This is uh, inconsistent with protocol. You know, you sit, he comes, you put your hand down, he gives you the kiss of a piece, you know, on the, on the ring, that type of stuff. But he doesn't. St but the personality in the presence of the man was so overwhelming that it caused Abraha to stand up. And I imagine it. They say he was a very handsome man. Um, slightly above medium height. You know, like towards the tallish end, but not tall. And uh, he's uh, elderly. And uh, he's lived in the element, in the desert. Mm. So uh, that has certain effects on the face and on the features, you know, the wisdom of the desert. And then from his genes will come the Rasul. So there's certain genetic resemblances. Mm -hmm. And it's enough to force a man to stand. Then the, the, the chief... Abdul Muttalib sat on the ground and Abraha didn't sit on the throne. He came and sat on the floor with him. Then he goes, uh, ask, what do you want? This is him trying to be benevolent. Ask what you want. His anticipation is that Abdul Muttalib will say, listen, O king, O general, uh, overlook this this venture of yours, we apologize on our part, let this thing be. But, Abra, uh, but Abdul Muttalib said, can you return my 200 camels, please? So the Abraha, Abraha was disappointed. You know, I got up for you. you. Your presence is overwhelming. I thought you're a great man, overflowing with wisdom, uh, years of experience, and this is what you asked for, 200 camels. So Abdul Muttalib smiled and he said, I am the Lord of my house. I am, I am the elder of my house and responsible for my property. The house has its own Lord and he is responsible for that one. So he said, give him the 200 camels. So he went and went back and ordered the inhabitants of Mecca to evacuate the city and go to the mountains. If you've been to the Haram, it's all mountains. 
ajeeb place, Subhanul Khaliq. Rock and such a dry rock, basaltic volcanic rock. And Subhanal Ladib, and Allah Rabbul Izza put his house there. I was I was there. I uh, there was uh, I was traveling with uh, you know they gave me a ride and, and uh, two soldiers uh, and I told him, them and I said listen had it not been for the house of Allah there's nothing in this land that anyone would come to visit it's rock you know what holiday do you go for a rock for? so they went to the to the mountains and the last to leave was Abr was Abdul Muttalib and the elders of Quraysh so they came and they held the the doorbell you know the ring on the door of the Kaaba and he pulled it and he said ya rab a time has come that every man looks after his own house look after your own house and he went up to the to the mountain and next morning can you imagine 13 elephants with 70,000 men make it it's a frightening experience uh, let me help you visualize. Imagine a gang of, you know, 20 bikies parked outside your house. You guys have bikies here? Huh? I don't know. They might be good people in case, you know, on the recording it says those stars said bad about bikies, they're, they're, they're fine. But you understand me, if 20 rough, tough people are standing outside your house, it, it's, it's intimidating. So 70,000 people, it's, so the, the Meccans have gone to the outskirts. And Nufail, who was, you know, the initial tribe that resisted Abraha, is walking with them. And Mahmoud, who was the giant of the elephant, walked and came in, in front of the Kaaba. So as he reached near it, uh, Nufail had learned certain commands and elephant uh, commands, you know, because he's learning as he's walking with, with the guide. So he came near the elephant. And he said, you're in front of the house of your Lord, kneel. So the elephant knelt in front of the car, which is an anti-climax for Abraha. <laughs> you know, like, this is embarrassing, you know, he, he's coming. So they poked the elephant, so they poked it, wouldn't go. Um, they got hooks, they started to put it and, and pull it, uh, wouldn't move. They decided to turn it, he would turn back. He was fine getting up to go that way. He was fine going right and left. He just doesn't want to go forward. And as the punishment tried, you know, to try to force that animal to get up and, and hit the Kaaba, um, you know, as this increased, all of a sudden on the horizon, um, the screeching of birds come from the horizon. And so much that it starts to cover the sky. These fast flying little birds carrying three little pebbles, one on each foot and one in the beak. And the screech, you know, can you imagine the army, 70,000, and out of Norway, from the above the mountains, come these birds screeching, and they come and pelt a stone, and they go, and the stones are ajeeb. You know, as it hits, wherever it hits, it goes straight in a linear line. So if it hits the head, it goes straight down and comes out of your bottom. If it hits this side, it comes out of... And then after it's hit, the body starts to rot from wherever it's hit. It seems almost radioactive. You know, um, it's not my claim. I'm just saying, you know. Like that. And can you imagine the havoc? Because how do you shoot a bird? You you, it, 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 there's no machine guns or anything. It's a scare. You can't do anything. And they're just flying and, choo, choo, and, the, and the pelts and the soldiers are falling and, and one after the other. And Abraha started to run and the pelt got him. They say he got on his horse and he ran with a few people, but it had got him. By the time he reached, uh, you know, a stop close to to Yemen, his heart fell out of his chest. So Allah Rabbul Izza says, Jalla Subhana, Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashabil fil. You want to see a king? Look. 
Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashabil fil? Didn't you see what your Lord did to the companions of the elephants? Ya Malik. Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashabil fil? Didn't you see what your Lord did to the companions of the elephant? Alam yaj'al kaydahum fi tadlil? Didn't he make their plans into a disgrace? وَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ طَيْرًا أَبَابِيلِ And sent upon them the birds أَبَابِيلِ تَرْمِيهِمْ بِحِجَارَةٍ مِّنْ سِجِّيلِ And he hit them, was casting at them pebbles of baked clay فَجَعَلَهُمْ كَعَصْفٍ مَأْكُولِ And he left them like chewed out lumps of fodder scattered around. Now in history, this is a huge event. 70,000 have gone to attack, you know, 3,000 Bedouins. And 70,000 army of 13 elephants destroyed. It's not a small, unnoticeable event. So they call this Am, Am al-Field, the year of the elephant. Now on the hilltops, amidst the Quraysh, was a young lady. She's pregnant around six, seven months. Her name is Amina. And in her womb is the master of both worlds. And in this year, he would be born. Muhammad. Sallallahu ala Muhammad. And the event in our history would outshine the event of the elephant by many, many. Do you see how your Lord highlights so that you could see that which year was he born? The Aam al Fil. And his birth, so far as me and you are concerned, far more glamorous and far more superseding. The event of the elephant. And it is our honor and our privilege that Allah Rabbul Izzain, His infinite grace and mercy, chose to make us of the Ummah of the Rasul. What an, what an honor, Ya Rabb, what an honor to have the Rasul as the Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as your Rasul. Um, the saddest part is we don't really know the honor. You hear about it. What an honor. You, in your heads, you think, what an honor. You don't really know why the honor. It is... Uh, how much time do I have, Brother Muhammad? 22, 3. Uh, is that the present time? No, because we have another place to go to, yeah? I'm okay? So, uh, when is the next event, my brother? Okay, so inshallah. So, to understand the honor of being from the Ummah of the Rasul, I will give you just this one mafhum of the hadith. The Rasul alayhi afdala salatu wa tammu taslim, one day is standing in salah crying. In his salah, he recited the words of uh, Isa alayhi salam. Uh, and he recited the words of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, cries out to his Lord that these asnam, these idols, have misled many of uh, the people. And you punish who you please and you reward or you forgive who you please. And then he read the qawl of Isa alayhi salam. And in both, there's a hint of the prophets trying to intercede for the ummah. There's a, there's a hint in both of the verses. In tu'adhibhum fa'innahum ibadik, wa in tu'khfillahum fa'innak anta al-ghafoor al-rahim. So then the Rasul started to cry and said, Allahumma ummati, ummati, oh Allah, my ummah, my ummah. And he cried until Allah, Rabbul Izzah, sent Jibreel. He said, go to Muhammad, sallallahu ala Muhammad, وَسَلْهُ مَا يُبْكِيهِ And ask him what is making him cry. And Allah already knows, Jalla subhanahu. So he came 
and he found the Rasul saying, Allahumma ummati, ummati. Oh Allah, my ummah, my ummah. So the Prophet sallallahu Jibreel alayhi salam went back to Allah Rabbul Izzah and he said, Ya Rabb, he's saying, Allahumma ummati, ummati. Oh Allah, my ummah, my ummah. Allah Rabbul Izzah says, go tell him. We will satisfy you. We will please you with regards to your ummah and we will not disgrace you. This is enough for you. You know, the Prophet is more haris over you than your parents. Rarely would your parents stand up in the night crying for you. They'll say, I love you. They'll give you a lunch cookie and this and that, you know. But rarely will they, I mean, they are Ahlul Fadl and my Allah increase them. But it's not something they do regularly. But the Prophet's night and day was you. You know, once he started to cry. And he said uh, about you, my brothers who will believe in me not ever having seen me. So the Ashab said, aren't we your brothers? He said, no, you're my companions. My brothers are those who will believe in me not ever seeing me. You are his, you are his, his thought and his concern. So it is sufficient and honor that because of this Rasul, Allah Rabbul Izzah has said, don't worry, we will please you with regards to your Ummah. And do you think the Rasul would be happy seeing one of you go to Jahannam? It is sufficient and honor. So my dear brothers, as part of uh, repayment of debt, because we are indebted to the Rasul, um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has rights over us. And the rights of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are a few. One of it is when you hear his name say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Salawat and especially on certain days, Friday and so on, increase the salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Second is follow the Rasul. Alayhi afdalu salatu wa tammu taslim. But follow him ala basira. Follow him with open eyes. As in, find out exactly what he wanted you to do, do that. Don't follow what you think he thought he wanted you to do. Don't follow by creating divisions and hatred and animosity and anxiety and things like that. This isn't what the Prophet wanted. Let me ask you a few questions, my dear brothers. Was there monafiqs in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Because the verses are clear. Yeah. Did the Prophet know the Munafiqs or not? Did the Prophet ever kick one of them out of the masjid? No, no, no. Do you see? Find the murad of Allah and the murad of the Rasul. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul was a renowned Munafiq. Every Muslim knew he's a Munafiq. He died. His son came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa My father has died. Can you attend the janazah? Munafiq. The Quran says, Inna al-munafiqeen fi al-darkil asfali min al-nar. They are abode as Jahannam. The Rasul gets up, goes to the janazah. Then he takes his uh, cloak, his bisht, his, uh, you know, the abaya, and he wraps the munafiq in it. Like, do you see what I'm trying to learn? The, the sunnah of the Prophet, bi adabin jam, is not the beard in the siwak. This is a very small aspect, my dear brothers. Um, learn, learn the purpose of the Rasul. Learn what he wanted, the murad of Allah and the murad of the Rasul. Of Allah, and put things in perspective. Um, I have come here to, to your land and my Allah protected for you. Um, and um, from the little that, that I have heard and seen, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, divisions amidst the people who have so much in common. 
you know, mashallah, you've kept very strong links with with your with your tradition. I saw the Imam Sab um, speak in Urdu to a congregation in the UK. You know, uh, so uh, Alhamdulillah, you've kept a strong a strong link back home. Um, and so, and most of the people here seem to be from the subcontinent, from from my walking around and the little I have seen. Alhamdulillah, you're all Muslims. Alhamdulillah, you all consider the Prophet as the Prophet. Alhamdulillah, you all consider Allah as one. Um, and rem I give you this advice, Wallahi, because my heart bleeds for you in, in some aspects. Two brothers can fight. You know, blood brothers. Like two blood brothers can fight. When they fight, the wives and the children look. But the blood brothers have blood between them like as in they're from the same mom and dad that will wash over the conflict that they've created later on they will become friends but their families won't mm. amidst the next generation it will become animosity the one after that they will spit at each other's faces the one after that will become bloodshed it is the responsibility of the elders to ensure that some, and if you was the ones on the manhaj of the Ahl Hadith can lead this, generations after you will thank you for it. That you become the cause of the unity amidst the ranks of the Muslims. Certain things understood, the person is on a different yeah, but there's no need to have animosity. There's, there's no need for this. You know, don't say salam to this person. Don't say alaykum to this person. Don't enter this masjid. Uh, you see the haram. Mecca, Medina. All sorts of ajaib and gharaib of people come there. Wallah, ajab al ajab. I was there in the road of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And... Uh, you know, there's a lot of zihan, a lot of people. They very, very. All of a sudden, one brother looked up, you know, where the roof, where the muazzin gives the azan. I don't know if you've been inside the haram. There's this little, the, yeah. that tall, there's a roof. Yeah. So one brother jumped up and touched the roof. I, there, there's no hadith or sunnah. No, there's, uh, you won't even find it in, in cartoons of, 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 the, uh, of fiqh, you know. So this one jumped up and touched the roof. So I looked. Hundreds got up and jump up and touch the roof line. <laughs> Wallah, ajab ul ajab. So I, I uh, do you understand? But they allow them to come. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. you don't refrain people from the masajid of Allah. This is not the deen. Yeah. yeah? So we, we don't in our masajid. Open your doors to, to everyone. Invite everyone. Whatever sect and denomination. You are from the Ummah of Muhammad. What your problem is, you know, you have made wrongs and mistakes, which is between you and your Lord. He will deal with it, Akhil Karim. <coughs> May Allah give you and me and all of us Jannah. And we are not people that want anyone to go to Jahannam. And don't become people bearing the stamps of Jahannam Muslims. You know, kafir, munafiq, bid'ati, akhi, don't, don't, don't do these things. Yeah? Um, and the, the requirement for us, please remember, is to embody the deen and the land of reality, not in texts. You understand? Communism looked really good in text, but it was a real problem in reality. So embody the teachings of the Rasul in real life. And wallahi, it, it can't be helped but loved. <coughs> Your worst enemy cannot help but love you. Trust me when I... I will give you one personal example, yeah? So that you see the, the effect of the sunnah. I was a younger person in university days, and I was um, walking out of uni with a friend, and this friend, being young, uh, he used a, a curse word towards me. You know, a rude word. Um, now, I... Ha you know, our background is, we're also a bit sensitive, you know, so, uh, we come from Afghanistan, you see, so our people are a bit more on the other side. So, uh, and the sheikh goes, yes, yes, I understand this one. So, uh, I turned around and I started, you know, uh, 
reacting angrily like who talks like this like learn manners and, and, I, and I went on and as I'm talking as I'm you know retaliating and arguing back and, and um, this this brother sat down and he opened his bag and I'm and I'm telling him off you know and he looked and he found an apple and he picked and he got up and he said So I said, what? He said, the prophet said, when you argue, s swap gifts. <laughs> you know, this happened some 15 or so years ago. Until now, I mention it in my khutbas and in my durus. And one day I was talking about it. His father was sitting in front of me. I was in a khutbah. And in the khutbah, I said, glad tidings to you. It was your son. He cried. And right now, I want to cry. You know? Because the sunnah pierces the heart. Do you understand? The, the sunnah as the murada, it, you can't help. How can you hate a person like that? Our weakness is we, we can't implement the sunnah. We do our own versions of the sunnah. You know, and that spoils the actual sunnah. So do not become people that deter people from the sunnah of the Rasul become people that people are attracted to you because of the sunnah of the Prophet And a lot of the sunnah is based on this, how to win the hearts of people. A lot of the sunnah, because deen, what, what's the purpose? The hadith of the Prophet وسلم, he says the fire was kindled, fire was burning. My example was, I saw people rushing towards the fire like, like moths. Rush, and I found myself holding their belts and pulling them back. That's the purpose of prophethood, is to hold people from Jahannam. So, to win, to do that, is a battle of hearts and minds. So the sunnah of the prophet is all to teach us how to win people. To save people from Jahannam. The Prophet used to wear perfume. Yeah, Umar ibn al-Khattab says, if you spend a third of your wealth in perfume, it is not israf. Can you imagine a third of your wealth? Yeah, your, your house is, I think, a few hundred thousand pounds. Like, yeah, you divide that into three, buy perfumes. Your wife will tell you, honey, go sleep in the masjid from now on. You know, this is, this is too much sunnah. So, but what's the purpose of the perfume? Why do we put perfume on? Isn't it to be pleasant around people? What else is it for? It's the sunnah of the Rasul. But the murad is, so you're fresh, you're pleasant, people are attracted to it, people uh, you know, uh, are pleased by it. It's the sunnah of the Prophet Yeah? Um, the Rasul looked pleasant. Can you imagine? You know, uh, I don't say this is in a negative way. Um, you know, I do not be believe in being derogatory. Um, but in this good country, there was a time uh, washing was uh, was rarely done. You know, one of the past monarchs boasted that I wash myself once a month. Um, if you move a bit that way towards um, Rome, you had the famous... Um, Artist of the Renaissance, Michelangelo. You know, the Vatican, all that, his, his work of art. His father gave him an advice. He goes, son, don't ever bathe. Don't ever wash yourself. And on record, there's no record of him ever washing himself. Very. So society was like that. You know, there was no toilet paper, this and that, so they used to go to the toilet, they used to stink. The underarms, there was no deodorant, and there wasn't shaving and stuff like that, so it was... Uh, and then the smoke of cooking, and it was a very filthy environment. Can you imagine? Like a world like that. Uh, here there was no... You know, the first, subhanAllah, just so that you know your legacy, the first person that brought soap and shampoo to this country was a Muslim. You know that? And he became the, the uh, you know, the special uh, person of, of the king and he used to shampoo the king's hair and hairdresser and things like that. He brought it in here. 
do you see your, your your legacy was very different to what you think it is so from that society of filth and stench and smell imagine you came out and you entered a muslim society these are the characteristics of the muslim society they say you could trace the prophet by his perfume on the streets so all of a sudden you come from filth in Medina it's glowing Everyone else doesn't wash at all. This man used to wash five times a day. Everyone else's teeth were black. You know, they used to deliberately yellow their teeth. Dark, black, uh, you know, a plaque at the back of it. They say the Rasul, when he used to smile, his teeth used to sparkle. Aisha radiallahu anhu says when he sallallahu alayhi wa used to sleep, he used to put a siwak next to him. When he used to turn his head at night, he used to siwak and then put it back. Can, can you see that the world was attracted to it. It was pleasant, it was clean, it was fresh, it was beautiful, it was energetic. Everyone else used to wake up midday this day. What time did the Muslim wake up? Before Fajr, what are they doing? Washing. And then in Qiyam. Do you, can you kind of see that, that, that maybe, you know, we, we, have, we, have, we have got things slightly wrong? So, get the murad on the murad of the Prophet ﷺ. In your appearance, be very pleasant. In your smell, be very pleasant. But further than the smell of atr and the, the look of the appearance is the look of your akhlaq. If you embody the character of the Rasul, it can't help but pierce hearts. You can't... How... how how can a person resist the character of the one whom Allah says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عظيم. Beautiful is your character. Outstanding is your character. Verily thou art on a more sublime and exalted pinnacle of character. You, oh, ya Rasul, oh, your character is amazing. Yeah? So, my dear brothers, um, too much talking is no good. So, I will end with that. And again, it's been a pleasure. Um, to be with you, my Allah, Rabbul Izz, accept uh, my journey for his sake and accept this talk for his sake and free it from riyah and, um, and, and the wrongs that the heart might whisper. And my Allah, Rabbul Izz, bless you with ilm and taqwa and, and Allah, Rabbul Izz, unite your community and make you a cause of khair uh, for this world and the next world. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. فقلت ما قلت إن تكو حسنة فمن الله وإن تكو سيئة فمن نفسي وشيطان والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته